We've looked at the meaning of equity, the advantages and disadvantages. How do you raise the equity, both for private and on listed company? And let me wrap up this part of equity financing by talking about dividend policy. Remember, one of your decisions to make as a finance manager is dividend policy decision. And this is what are the policies the companies usually use to decide when they pay dividend or not. And there are two of them. There's irrelevance theory and there's residual theory. And please pay attention to this. I'm going to explain it very well and you should just get it once and for and be fine. Irrelevance theory is just talking about the fact that shareholders don't care whether they get return from dividend or from share price appreciation. Remember, for every shareholder, they've bought shares so that they can make return. Their return does not necessarily have to come from dividend. Likewise, it does not necessarily have to come from share price appreciation. So for irrelevance theory, they are saying they don't care wherever it's coming from. They just want return. So they care less on whether you are paying dividend. If you are not paying dividend, just make sure that you are investing that money profit that you have made properly such that the share price of the company is going up and they can sell their shares and make money from share price acquisition. So what I'm saying, shareholders can either make money from two ways, price appreciation of share price appreciation or from dividend. So they are saying that if you don't pay dividend, then let's get this one. So what we are saying in relevance theory is that it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter. whether a company is paying dividend or not. In as much as shareholders can make return from share price appreciation that's the summary appreciation yeah that is increase of share price that's what we mean by appreciation yeah when share price is going up that is irrelevant theory they don't care it, it cannot just be bothered just make sure that the share price is going up right however the residual theory is different what residual theory is saying is that don't rush to pay dividend to us. That's what shareholders will be saying if company is using that approach. Only pay dividend when you have invested the money in the available good investment opportunities. So before you pay dividend, check first. Are there opportunities you can invest? If there are opportunities, please go and invest. Don't pay us dividend. Remember, in relevance theory, they don't care. Pay us, don't pay us. We, we, are, we don't care. Just let us be able to make money from either of this or this. If you pay dividend, it's fine. If you don't pay dividend, it's fine. But residual theory say, don't pay dividend. That's what they are saying. Don't, uh, this looks like four. <laughs> yeah. Don't pay dividend until company has invested in all available good investment opportunities. So it's after the residual amounts, which is the residual profits, after I'm, all the investment have been made, when there is no more investment opportunity, then what you have left is your residual profit can then be paid as dividend. And I hope this simplifies it for you because 
in literatures you can see it in different ways and feel a bit confused so that is it for dividend policy and it's as simple as that and you need to know it right remember i said there is one instrument that behaves very funny yeah it behaves both as debt and as equity and that is preference shares so let's just quickly look at that to close this particular lecture so let me just close it with preference shares like i said it behaves like debt and also behaves like equity so i'm just going to share with you some of those characteristics that make it makes it uh prevent share looks like equity and some of those characteristics that make it look like debt so let's just have it into column equity characteristics and debt characteristics i'll just give it to each so that you can understand what i'm talking about so just like equity in when you talk of preference share dividend are never guaranteed so dividends are not guaranteed so this makes it looks like it's equity likewise when you are talking of preference shares It is usually not secured. And what do I mean? Remember, just like equity characters, when we're talking about the advantages, that company does not have to pay back. It's because it's not secured. Equity is also not secured. So because you have given your money to the company, it doesn't mean you need to, company needs to provide collateral or any assets such that if you are not able to pay, you will not go and take the asset. No. It's not secured, so preference shares are also like that. So, so principal can be lost. Yeah. Okay. So which means this is also risky. But please take note: this is ranked higher than equity, so risky, but less risky when you compare to ordinary equity when we look at equity what we're talking about is ordinary shares and that is ordinary equity yeah now let's look at debt why do we say preference share behaves like that because the interest that is paid the dividend that is paid is a fixed amount anytime it needs to be paid is fixed percentage the same way you have maybe five percent debt ten percent debt that's the same way preference share works ten percent five percent just like that the only difference is that sometimes if there is not enough profit, it might not be paid. And that's why we said it's not guaranteed. But if there is enough profit that we can pay it, the percentage is usually fixed. Unlike dividend, that it depends. Today we pay 50 cents per share. So next year we can pay 30 cents per share. Sometimes we pay 50 cents per share. So we can just pay anything. But for preference share, it is fixed. Anytime we want to pay it. And likewise, just like debt is ranked higher than equity, preference share is ranked just like i explained earlier is ranked higher than equity so which means on liquidation when we need to settle all the providers of fund debt orders will be settled first followed by preference share orders and ordinary share orders which are the equity orders will be the last to be sorted and that is it on equity now we're looking at debt and that is coming from how we're going to finance our investment which is this asset we can finance it using equity or using liability or we can even mix the two but it has to be from these two sources now what is debt we said equity gives right ownership debt is funds made available made available to business without and that is the difference without ownership right and what comes with it if there is no ownership right however with a 
obligation to pay back. So there is no right, however, there is obligation to pay back. Yeah. All right. So that is the meaning of debt, and it's as easy as as that. Yeah. And, and in terms of um, advantages and disadvantages, as you can imagine. The tax advantages, if I put advantages here, and I put disadvantages for the company, yeah. Can leverage on what we discussed under equity. This one, interest is tax deductible. Interest is tax deductible. That's a very good advantage. Disadvantage for the company is that um, both interest and principal and principal must be repaid. So advantage is that it's usually cheaper to raise. Likewise, cost of debt is generally cheaper than equity. When we are talking of cost of debt, here we are talking about the interest. Yeah, when we are talking of a cheaper to raise, we are talking of like transaction cost. So they are not the same thing. Don't get confused. Okay, so that is broad meaning of debt. Now, sources of debt itself usually it can either come from bank or from public investors as well and here public investors can be anybody and that is why when you issue when you get a liability from the bank it is called bank loan but when you get the money from anybody, be it from company, from individuals, you and I, from anybody, that is called bonds. And that's different between bank loan and bonds. It's about the source, where it is coming from. Right. Bank is com loan is bank loan is coming from the bank, but this is where I know a lot of people struggle bonds. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes to explain this. First of all, Let's talk about the way bonds are ranked in terms of seniority. So let's talk about seniority of bonds. Seniority means the way they are ranked in case if there is liquidation. How would they be settled first? The first type of bond that is mostly highly ranked is called the venture. And it's called the venture because it is secured. That is, there is a particular asset that has been identified in that company that will be sold if we are not able to pay back that money to the owner of the debt. So, what we are saying is, before this kind of venture is given to the company, the person making the fund available would have identified an asset, say, that car. Nothing must happen to that car. You cannot sell it. You cannot do this to it. It will put a lot of restriction on it. Until you repay me my money, you can't use... You can't sell that asset because if you are not able to pay me my money, that is the asset that I'm going to sell to recover my money. That is a secure debt. And you can see it is number one rank. The second type, which is second rank, is the unsecured one. The unsecured one doesn't have a specific asset to it, but on liquidation, they will be settled first before shareholders are sorted. In fact, the third one is called the mezzanine. The mezzanine bonds. You know, we call it mezzanine finance. Yeah, they are junk. They are also called junk bonds because I mean, they are the least rank debt you can ever imagine. Yeah, they are junks. Yeah, this is also called investment grade because it's really secured and less risky so likewise the risk as you come down increases 
So risk increases, but what happens to the return? The higher the risk, the higher the reward. So which means you expect the reward to also increases downward. So return will also increases that, which means this is lowest return and this is the highest return. And likewise, this is the highest risk and this is the lowest risk. Very important to note the way those bonds are ranked because it's a typical exam question that you can be asked. Now, let me quickly give you good introduction to bonds, even if you don't use it in this exam, which is going to make your life easy in these exams. But as a finance person, I always advise you need to understand how bond works. A lot of people run away from it. Don't run away from it, right? Because you're still going to meet it in advanced finance management, right? So now let's look at bonds generally. Like I said, bond is just the same thing as loan. It's the same thing as debt. The only difference is the source. It's coming from individuals. It's coming from companies. It can come from anybody, right? And because of that, it has a different name. So it's just a paper. I give you my money, and you give me a paper that you are owing me, and you pay me back on so-so-so date. So usually, one bond is equals to $100 per value. But that is not the price of the bond. That is the book value of the bond. So this is called the book value of the bond. So for one bond, the book value is $100. That is the book value. That is called par value. Some people call it nominal value. It's the same thing they are talking about. It's $100. So if you have to buy 20 bonds, your book value of the bond is 2000 20 yes 20 times 100 that is two thousand dollars because you have 20 bonds right if you have 300 bonds in terms of value remember this is quantity in units 300 units of bond is the same thing as thirty thousand dollars worth of bond in book value all these are book value but that is not the price of the bond. The price of the bond can be anything. Yeah. If the price of that bond is greater than the par value, which means greater than $100, that bond will be said to be trading at a premium. But if it's less than $100, say EG, they are selling that bond for $90. Say that bond is selling at a discount because it's less than its par value. So premium is EG is selling for 102 per bond. Right. So the price of the bond can be different from the, the book value. Please take note. And the interest on bond is usually not called interest. It is called coupon. So you might be hearing coupon and be thinking is a difficult word. It's not different from interest. It's the same thing. It's just a different word they are using for it. Just to show that this is interest on bond, not on bank loan. That's why it is called coupon. So usually, this is also given in percentages, just like your normal interest. And to calculate the amount, because they might give you 10% coupon, amount of coupon, remember it's different from the rate of coupon. Rate is percentage. Amount is the real cash. And how do you get it? Is You use the coupon rate, which is the coupon percentage, times par value. So, which means always coupon rate times 100 for one bond. So, if the coupon rate is 5%, you know that that bond will give 5% of 100. So, one bond will always give $5 as interest every year. Yeah. So, I'm just... Yeah. So, that is coupon. And that is annual coupon. Some bond can say they are semi-annual coupon. So, if it's semi-annual, means you pay this every six, six months. Right. And also, you can have, now, examples. Redeemable bonds. Redeemable bonds means that the bonds must be repaid back. Yeah, that's what it means. It means must be repaid. Yeah, you might be wondering which debt will not be repaid. It's possible. 
Some debts are not repaid. And that is why they are called irredeemable bonds. You can all have that. Yeah? This behaves like equity. Never repaid. You will just be earning fixed interest. Yeah? Likewise, you can have something we we'll call zero coupon bond. Zero coupon bond means that this bond does not pay coupon, does not pay interest. So does doesn't pay coupon. So which means you buy it now and you wait until the expiry of the bond when you will get your principal back, which usually at par. Or sometimes they might also redeem it at a premium or even at a discount, depending on the terms. You can also have something we we'll call convertible bonds. Convertible bonds. And what are convertible bonds? They are just bonds with option to convert debt, I mean the bond, to equity. So what company does here is instead of repaying back the bonds, they put an option there for the investor to say, if you wish, you can convert it to equity. So we just turn you to shareholders. So instead of paying you back your money, we'll give you shares. Yeah, and sometimes this can be really attractive, yeah, to investors. So usually you expect convertible bonds to be cheaper in terms of interest than the straight bonds. Straight bond is the ones that are not convertible. Yeah, opposite is straight bonds. Right? In case you hear straight bonds, all these can be straight bonds, yeah, because they are not convertible. They don't have any option. Right, so please take note. In terms of risk, convertible definitely will be less risky because it's so attractive. It has option to be converted, so you expect it to have cheaper interest rate. Yeah, because they already have additional sweetener, which is the conversion option. Yeah. So please that is a few examples of bonds and basic things you need to know about bonds. And by the time you go into investment appraisal videos, you will see that this general understanding I've given you is very important. And I'll wrap this up with another source of finance, which is not usually different from debt financing, is Islamic finance. The only thing is that you need to know the fact that this Islamic finance, like I said, is a, debt, is a form of debt finance, but it is based on... Islamic laws, yeah, which is usually the Sharia. The Muslims will probably be able to deal with this quite easily. And the way I'm going to summarize this for you is just the things you need to know about it, and that is the fact that this has some prohibitions, which means some activities are prohibited. So yeah, so that is the biggest thing you need to know on Islamic finance: the prohibitions, what is not allowed, and I also quickly mention what are uh, allowed. So when you are going to get money from an Islamic bank, you must make sure that you are not charging interest. Interest is not allowed. That is riba. You can charge fees. Yeah, you can recover your fees. But riba, which is called interest, is not allowed. You cannot use that money for gambling activities. So if you're looking for money for speculations, you cannot get Islamic finance. Likewise, they cannot give money to aqua companies. And likewise, pornography. So these are examples of activities that are not allowed under Islamic finance. However, if you want to get finance from Islamic, these ones are allowed. These activities are allowed and they are called different names. The first one is called Murabaha. Rabaha, and this is like a trade credit. Yeah, you can get that to do trading activities, normal trading activities that does not relate to those restricted uh, uh, activities. Ijara is another one, yeah, which is lease financing that is allowed. Likewise, you have something you call the Muda Rabah. Yeah, which is like equity financing. Yeah. So not necessarily restricted to debt. You can also have some form of equity. 
yeah depending on what you're trying to finance yeah so you have what you cost to cook yeah it's very popular and that is the debt finance but remember without interest and the last one is the musharaka which is on venture capital for smes yeah so these are allowed but these one are not allowed and that's all you need to know under islamic finance is based on islamic laws and we'll keep going the next video will go straight to cost of capital and that's where we now start learning how to calculate cost of equity cost of debt and how to choose which one should we be using to finance our business keep liking keep sharing